Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to Dune Spice Wars, a strategy game that entered into early access just the other day, and as you can quite plainly see, it is based on Frank Herbert's Dune, as we find ourselves on the now rather famous planet of Arrakis. The recent movie actually turned out to be decent, which uh, shocked and surprised the ever-living hell out of me, no doubt about it. Though I'm not willing to go so far as to say that it was necessarily a good movie just yet, as I think a lot is going to ride on the second entry. It is going to make or break the current movie adaptations, in my opinion. Anywho, as mentioned, this is a strategy game, and... At the first glance, it looks a little bit Civilizations-esque, but as you might be noticing, the game of course runs in real time. The combat is carried out in real time, the economy and everything is real time. Which is a very interesting decision and one that I was a bit hesitant at at first, because I'm wondering, okay, you're gonna make a Civ game, but make it run continuously and smoothly. Hmm... I can see some complications arising from this, in particular due to... Well... One of the problems is, in a Civ game, quite a lot of things happen every turn, in terms of uh, diplomacy, in terms of troops movements, in terms of economy, yada yada yada. Making all of that run smoothly in real time might be rather challenging, and indeed there are most assuredly some issues. The game can feel, um, hectic at times. As you're being attacked by rival factions, as you're being attacked by uh, Fremen raiders, as you're being attacked by sandworms, as you're being attacked by rebellions in your settlements, etc. And all of these things are happening simultaneously on a fairly large map where movement is very, very difficult, as traveling through the Great Grand Desert will be continuously sapping your unit's supplies. And once they run out of supplies, they start running out of health at a very rapid rate, and of course on occasion an enormous sandworm might pop up, oh, a la the sand, these worm signs right there, and devour your entire army. I almost feel like the game needs a, uh, a, a half speed mode in addition to the pause to make it a little bit more, um dealable with on certain occasions, but it actually works out relatively well, and what I'm particularly impressed with is there are a ton of mechanics to interact with in the game. You've of course got a, a good old-fashioned research system here, split between intelligence, uh, logistics, economy, and military tabs. It might not look particularly vast, and it isn't, but the game is designed for far more rapid play than your usual civilization game. You've then got the Lanzarad, which all the factions can interact with, even though it makes absolutely no sense for the Fremen to be able to interact with it in any way whatsoever, but details, details. They can interact with it to a lesser degree, however, compared to House Harkonnen. I almost said Harkonnen there. See, the, the game calls them the Harkonnen, and <laughs> it's not the Harkonnen, it is the Harkonnen, goddammit, but details and House Atreides. You've also got an espionage system, where not only can you use agents to spy on your rival factions, you can also use them to infiltrate things like the Spice Guild, the, the Chaum, the Lanzard, and even Arrakis itself for various benefits. All of these things do different things. Furthermore, you can also carry out various operations. In fact, we're gonna set up a, um, I think I've got a supply, yes, I've already got the supply drop up, so that's not a big deal at the moment. And you can also, of course, send your dudes into the enemy to carry out all kinds of wonderful things, to the point where you can even actually outright assassinate an enemy leader. For now, we've got Abi here. He is an emissary to a siege, as that's another mechanic. You can discover sieges and begin trading with them. Grimlab here, for example. I've got a 100% relationship with them. Not a very Harkonnen thing of me to do, I know, but the sieges are really good. You give them water, and they give you as tons of resources, as well as when you get an ambassador with them, a huge bonus. 20% gold income is... 
pretty damn massive. Pretty damn massive. And of course, you've also got the military. You've been seeing a little bit of the fighting there in the background. The combat is... Not amazing. It's serviceable for what it is. It's two groups of people bapping each other over the heads. Um, it isn't certainly nothing special, but it's a combat system. It exists. It does its job reasonably well. And it does have some complexity to it. For example, you can see the gunners here. Collateral damage. Range attack deals 30% of the damage to all allies near their target. Because, of course, they're Harkonnen. Ah. <sighs> Oh well. They also deal AoE damage to the enemy with the Demolition Team, which is far more effective. And they also deal damage to the enemy's armor. We're gonna spread out here a bit so as to not take too much, uh, too much damage here. It might seem rather silly for your units to shoot themselves, but these are Harkonnen units, after all, and they've actually got units that grow stronger the more damage they have taken. They even have some units that gain attack power when friendly units straight up die, which is interesting, definitely. Uh, we're going to activate a supply drop operation here so we can begin regaining state points as the Siege of Siege Tabar is going to... It's going to take a while, it's going to take a while. But luckily, the AI just sacrificed that entire army trying to walk past one of my occupied settlements. Yeah, the, uh, the, the AI needs a little bit of work here and there, uh, very much so. You can also engage ranged units with melee units, and that will prevent them from shooting. So, you know, there there is a little bit of strategy, there's a little bit of tactics here, but... It's a fairly simplistic system, but again, it does the job. Now, what I am annoyed about is that there is no... Oh, no, that's over there, that's fine. There is no air power at all. Um, you can use shuttles to transport your units around the map. That's another sandworm, is it? Oh, that's over there, okay. So, for example, I've got a R, r field. Yes, I've got an R field over here. <sighs> when I'm in range of the R field, I can transport my units to any other settlement that also has an R field. And once I do this, they move, of course, a hell of a lot faster. And due to the size of the map, you really do need to use this mechanic, as again, everything runs in real time. So if the Atreides decide to attack me over here now, I'm gonna have a problem, as my militia are unlikely to hold them off. Or if the, um, I think there's a smugglers over here somewhere. Oh, maybe not. If somebody attacks me over here, same kind of problem. And your units, they don't mean, they don't move painfully slow, but they do move slow. And if they are moving in territory that you do not own, then they begin using up their supplies. You can see the little orange bar there. That is their supplies. If they run out of supplies in the deep desert, their asses are going to be grasped awfully quickly. As you can see, the deep desert here will actually inflict a bunch more supply loss on units. There are even harsher territories, desolation scattered around as well, as there are some unique biomes. You can see there's a polar sink right here, for example. And I think we've got a uh, Imperial Basin over here, which is a special region giving special benefits. Meanwhile, the Deep Desert, you can see 300% daily supply drain. Mucho ouchies. Let's cycle these guys back so I don't lose my valuable Lancelot guards. Lancelot as well is one of those interesting mechanics that you can interact with, but before I go into uh, too much of the mechanics here, I'm going to send out these guys too as they are losing a bit as well. There is one thing I feel the urge to comment on uh, early on here and that is Liet Kynes. The uh, race and gender swapped imperial planetologist. Yeah, the, the devs are a little bit in that direction, unfortunately. Um, the reason why Liet Kynes has been adopted from the movies, despite the developers claiming that they are making other choices to confer to uh, do with the books, for example. And honestly, I, here's the thing. The developers have actually made a pretty damn good game. I'm not criticizing the game yet. It does have some performance issues, and the logistics of a large map is a pain in the ass, but oh, the AI needs some work as well. But 
the game itself is very, very solid. I'm enjoying it a tremendous deal. But they have very much so a have-it-both-ways kind of approach to the game's lore. Where, for example, they've decided to make the Atreides uh, green and black with gold trimming. This they did to be closer to the book, which makes sense, because the Atreides' official colours are uh, red, green, and black, if I remember correctly. Uh, red for the, the icon itself, the eagle. <laughs> It kind of annoys me because I've mostly played the games. I've read the book way back in the day, but the games are what have left a visual impression on me. So I've always viewed the Atreides as blue, honestly. And yet at the same time, despite going, oh, the Atreides are totally green. How's Harkonnen are red and black? How's Harkonnen are not red and black? Their colors are actually blue and orange. So it's a bit of a, okay, um, why did you do this? Well, it's because they wanted the smugglers to be blue. That seems to be the most reasonable explanation. I'm not a huge fan of the inclusion of the smugglers as a major faction either. They did have a big role to play in the book, sure, but... I can't imagine the smugglers waging a full-scale war against House Harkonnen or Atreides. That just seems silly. The Fremen, fair enough, but where, where else? Okay, so Atreides was made this way because of the books, all right? So why is Liet Kynes not a white man? Well, that's because of the movies. Why? Because it's the current year. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking, That's uh, that was their actual argument. They did address this, and they simply stated that it's the current year, Liet Kynes is the most modern character, their literal words in that case, and um, therefore they were going to keep her from the movies, because this is a commentary on <sighs> colonialism and racism and the usual garbage. So, yeah. They're kind of trying to have it both way, where they're looking at the books and go like, oh, this is the reason why we want this. And then they look at the movies, but we actually want this as well. And of course, it's not like they're purely one way or the other either. It feels like the devs don't really give too much of a shit about the lore. They just pick and choose whatever fits in best with either their personal, uh, personal opinions or whatever is most expedient for the game. For example, there are ranged units. Now, for those of you who know Dune, ranged combat is a, is a wee bit of a problem in the Dune universe due to the existence of a highly advanced shield technology. The shield technology is not represented in the game really at all. Ah, goddammit. Uh, Raiders. Um... Actually, I'm hoping they might be able to hold that, but let's... Let's peel off a couple of house guard. Uh, let's let's peel. No, yeah, yeah. We'll peel off two units to make uh, sure we can deal with it. So, uh, worm sign. Okay. Well, I mean, we're I guess we're disengaging completely then. Let's do that instead, instead of losing anything to the worms. Right. So what do I was on about? Yes, uh, there are no shields in the game. The closer that you have is the armor stat right here. An armor stat can actually be destroyed by ranged attacks. So the dune shields that made ranged weaponry damn near obsolete in personal combat can be destroyed by ranged weaponry. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, um, I, I have some problems with that interpretation, and it was done for game reasons, and, you know, that isn't necessarily a problem either, like, okay, yeah, having the game completely without ranged combat would probably be pretty boring, and finding a way to balance the proper Dune shields with the need for gameplay would also probably be pretty damn difficult, honestly. I'm not saying otherwise. So, I'm not critiquing it as a game decision. I'm critiquing the developers for trying to have it both ways. Making whatever decisions is immediately convenient for gameplay, and then also using lore as an argument for why they want to put some of their own bullshit in there as well. <sighs> Anywho, it's not a deal-breaker by any stretch of the imagination. 
the game itself is damn solid. So let's get back to... Please don't be another worm over there. Thank you. Let's get back to discussing some more direct mechanics, shall we? As mentioned, the research tree right here, these give you pretty significant bonuses and they're not as short as they look, as the cost of unlocking these various researches will increase quite drastically and also dependent upon how many you've got unlocked. And knowledge, the resource mechanic, is relatively hard to come by actually, so research is not particularly particularly quick so each one of these unlocks is a pretty big deal and it gives pretty damn big benefits too like minus 20 percent military unit upkeep in water is a pretty big deal or it gives access to unique buildings like the processing plant or unique units like the support structure etc or access to additional resources that you can use to affect the landsraad the landsraad is a really really cool mechanic as well I would prefer it if the Fremen and the smugglers couldn't interact with it at all, frankly, or maybe the, sp the smugglers should be able to buy influence, I suppose, to affect some of the lesser houses, but it, I feel like it should be more of a unique mechanic than it actually is right now. So currently, there are three uh, positions available here. Now, I'm currently the Speaker of the Council, so I could have potentially re-rolled one of these earlier, but now we've to a vote. So we've got troop inventories, 100% unit recruitment cost. I don't mind. My army is fully fledged. I'm not going to be building any units anytime soon, so I'm just going to keep that as a support. Because, well, if my enemy needs to pay more money for their units, great. I don't need to. Then we've got an election for the Eye of the Council position. The Eye of the Council is a special shot. Charter? Charter. It has a set of uh, prerequisites. For example, you need to have 200 Landsveid standing. And you need to have at least two infiltration levels in every other faction. I currently have zero because I haven't really bothered with that. Harkonnen are less spy than Atreides. But Atreides, they do. And they're the only ones that do. So, would I like Atreides to gain two extra agents? Not necessarily, no, and Surveillance Committee. 100% land street standing losses for actions against other factions. I'm not really planning any uh, direct actions right now, so... I'll put House Atreides up there, but I'm going to put all my influence into stopping Atreides from getting the Eye of the Council. As you can see here, uh, these would be my, my regular votes, my 110 regular votes. And then the blue ones will be the additional influence, where I am, you know, uh, bribing, uh, blackmailing, etc. The various minor houses to throw their votes my way. I really like that mechanic. It gives you, it constantly gives you something to do, something to plan, something to deal with. Then you've got espionage. I have just used supply drop, so I'm going to rearm that and bring it up into my prepared operations slot. And do I want ghost market? I kind of want ghost market. I kind of want ghost market. Hmm. Yes. Let me uh, ready up Ghost Market as well, and that uses the Intel resource. You've got a um, you've got quite a lot of resources in the game, but it avoids the paradox trap of having it feel like straight up mana. This is one of those big things that paradox occasionally understands and all too often do not understand. It's fine to have fairly arbitrary resources that does certain things. Oh, by the way, this is the thing that really annoys me as well. There is a way to automate the recalling of harvesters to avoid them having been eaten by worms. This is a good thing, because you wouldn't want to be micromanaging that all the time. And there is no benefit whatsoever to having your harvester be eaten by a worm. But whenever it's pulled back, you have to manually redeploy it. Which is just pointless busy work. Like, that is just straight up pointless busy work. Because, again, there is no circumstance in which you're like, Oh, yes, uh, I would like for my carrier to actually be, or my harvester, to actually be eaten by a sandworm. Thank you very much. Like, there is no scenario in which that is a benefit to you. So, it, it's such an obvious thing that they need to add in that... I'm almost going to consider it just kind of an oversight slash bug right now, and I'm going to assume that they're going to put in the ability to automate the deployment and the withdrawal 
all the harvesters. Uh, we have a mission success. Good. So that's ready and ready to get going if I need it in the siege on Siege Tabar. Eh, shouldn't though. There also isn't a whole lot of AI, so if I, for example, move this unit over here, they'll just chill there. Like, what? What? There's a war going on? Well, I guess we better join in. <sighs> Mild annoyance, but again, nothing big to particularly worry about. Hmm. Complications, eh? Uh... <sighs> Damn. All of those are awful. Literally all of these are awful. And I don't have enough influence right now. Yes. Alright, alright. As there is a chance of your agents getting uh, captured whilst they're doing all of this. Though the chances are fairly small, uh, at least to begin with, but as you dedicate more and more resources to counter espionage, of course the odds rise considerably. I'm almost deal dealt with Siege Tabar here, so if just a sandworm could not show up right now, that'd be fantastic. As I'd like to get the Fremen out of the way ASAP. There we are. Siege Tabar has been captured and burnt. Lovely. And that means that the Fremen are out of the game and their settlements will return to being neutral. Lovely. Anywho, I was on about the uh, the topic of mana, didn't I? Yes, it is fine. What do you want? Plaz create. Actually, I wouldn't mind. Thousand two hundred for intel influence. Six hundred spice. I mean, not particularly interesting, but at the same time, I've got more of the resource he's asking for than I could ever possibly use. So fine. Right. So yes. Mana, returning to the topic for like the third time, good god. It is fine to have an arbitrary resource, like for example authority, required to do certain things. Like authority is used to take over a village. So long as that resource makes sense. Because in the player's mind, I understand what the game is trying to tell me. It is simply trying to tell me that you need enough authority, you need enough administrative power and central force to go into a village and say, no, you're my village now. You're not an independent village, you're not a Fremen village, you're not an Atreides village, you are my village. And you have to spend authority to do that. Makes perfect same sense. Same with intel. It is simply the, um, the, the amount of intelligence you have which has been... Uh, you know, simplified, instead of having like, oh, I have the blueprint for this, or the plan for that. You're simply using it as a generalized term, meaning the combined efforts and work of your spies. Again, makes perfect sense, just like influence. It represents, um, in the case of ha House Harkonnen, uh, bribery and backstabbing and blackmail. Whereas for Atreides, it would be more like uh, diplomatical, uh, diplomatic acumen, you know, knowing which buttons to press with whom, etc. But the problem comes in when mana is everything and you use like one or two mana resources because it very, very quickly removes that, that, ah, damn it, I get, uh, that justification, that, that sense of self-immersion when it just becomes a magic resource that does a magic thing. Uh, Imperator Rome was a beautiful example of this, where you could spend mana to have men just pop forth from the soil. It's like, okay, um, how, how, how does this work? This is a bit suspicious, don't you think? Yes, very suspicious, in fact. Um, so yeah, I, I'm actually really fond of that system. It's, it works very well and gives you a reason to engage with the various mechanics, and they are very rewarding too. Again, when you're doing something in the Lanzrad Council, it's a big deal. I couldn't stop them from being eyes at the council, did I? Well, they probably put literally all of their influence on getting elected as well, so... 
because it gives you big, big things. Like the Charter, two extra agent is a huge deal. Just like Speak for the Council is a big deal because it allows me to re-roll things. Like right now, the Judge of the Council is up for election. I would quite want that. But um, would I want anything? You know, I kind of want that to try and screw over Atreides a little bit, but I'd be screwing myself over more. So I'm going to re-roll this. 100% agent capture when an operation is detected. Ooh, that would be kind of nice to put on House Atreides. Yeah, that's good. We'll keep that one. Like, it feels significant, and it feels reasonable within the universe as well. Like, okay, you know, the Lancerad would absolutely have the power to do this. It would have the power to make the Dune governorship uh, permanent, etc. It has the power to basically win you the game. It has the power to give you elite units, which are really cool. The Lanzard are super awesome. Uh, they're also better than literally every other unit in the game, which means it's worthwhile getting them. I would like to see maybe a dual system, though, where you also have the Emperor's influence. Perhaps having high Lanzard influence would actually make it more difficult to, for you to be friends with the Emperor. But if you choose, like, the Lanzard would give you a lot of benefits early on, very high benefits, but if you became... You know, the uh, the Emperor's lapdog. Maybe you could gain access to the dreaded Sardaukar. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? And even, even better, but super difficult to get, and hyper-limited special unit. Hmm. There are some very cool things you could do with that. Right, we've got uh, Zayin there, which is also a special region, which will give me 500 hegemony points, which is yet another mechanic, which can be used to win you the game and unlock various uh, big, wonderful benefits. See, this is what I really like about the game, right? There are a lot of mechanics, but they don't really feel overwhelming, let me put it like that. It all feels fairly natural, and it all gives you things to do constantly. I rarely feel overwhelmed in the game, which is a real achievement considering how much shit can be happening. Um, you know, sandstorms sweeping the land, uh, your harvesters needing redeployment, the sandworms popping up and eating your ass, moving units, making sure you're not losing to attrition, making sure your units aren't wandering into the deep desert for no reason, etc. There are so many things to do, and yet it feels very comfortable and very natural. Like, there's also events like these, for example, which gives you uh, various little uh, objectives to carry out. There are so many things to do, and yet it's so well, it's, it's so well paced. I, it is a genuine achievement. I cannot overstate it, because you would think the game would feel incredibly frantic and incredibly stressful, but no, nah, it's... It's actually rather, rather chill. Hmm. Oh, mechanically, I have virtually no complaints about the game. Seriously, it's it's really damn nice, and it's good to have a solid Dune game again. Let me uh, bring them over in a shuttle here as well. Uh, heading over to Aishin, there. Yeah. I do feel that there should be actual air power, though, because on a planet like Arrakis, air units would be incredibly valuable due to their ability to, you know, cross the open desert, for example. Now, there are stuff like the, the Razor Winds, which could screw the hell out of uh, aircraft, but what you should instead do is just add in another environmental effect, where if the weather is this and this, you, you can't fly. And maybe it should be relatively frequent. Maybe air power should be something that can be deployed only at a significant cost, for example, for limited periods of times, but be fairly devastating when deployed. Or maybe you could even have it so that um, air power could be solely based on spacecraft and you'd have to get, like, the Lanceroids a permission to deploy them. Or maybe you could even add in, like, even greater interaction with the Spacers Guild. You know, there's a lot of cool things you could do. There's a remarkable room for additional mechanics in the game, which is very interesting. God damn it! I am getting kind of spammed with operations right now, which is why I would... Uh, kind of love it if the Imperial Intelligence thing was elected. Ooh, that's coming up in two more days now. Hmm, I have too much of actually absolutely everything right now, which I suppose is a little bit of a problem. Um, this is yet another mechanic. 
Man, I... It's really cool to see a game like this. I, I'm, I'm gushing a bit here. I really am. But damn, this is a solid game. It really is. And it's been a while since I've seen a game like this, because often, so many times, I have bitched about, like, Total War games or Paradox games where I'm saying, okay, listen here. You're selling your games to strategy players. You're selling your games to grand strategy players. You are selling your games to people who play these games constantly and love doing it. We're not scared of more mechanics. We're not scared of additional complexity. In fact, these are the reasons why we play the games in the first goddamn place. And so to finally see a game that actually has a ton of mechanics, has a lot of interaction, has a, a bunch of resources to keep control over. Like you've got money, plastic, manpower, fuel cells, water, authority, landslide right standing, you've got intel, you've got influence, you've got knowledge, you've got command points, you've got spice. Man, it's, it's so cool to... F I mean... I, I, I can hardly find the words. It, it's like I finally feel like I've got a game that wants to be a strategy game again. It doesn't want to be one little thing. It doesn't want to be just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm like a tactical strategy game. I do this one thing. Or oh, I have this one mechanic, you see. No, it's just a nice, big, fat strategy game like we used to get back in the good old days. I mean, solid enough to allow me to... Uh, Ignore the race and gender swapped elephant in the room after all. Which would normally annoy me a lot more, but current year. Anywho, um, when you, you will eventually unlock your capital once you reach, I think, 2000 hegemony. And you can then purchase very expensive, but also again, very powerful upgrades. Again, I return to that point again and again. This is one of the reasons why it makes these various mechanics so rewarding to engage with, because they're big deals. Like, I've got three economy ones, plus three knowledge, big deal. That's basically your entire start starting knowledge budget doubled. Uh, plus 30 knowledge on top of that, and minus 30% research hub, big deal. Chome Branch applies solar upkeep reduction to all ally villages in neighboring regions, 30% bonus Chome Spice exchange rate, and agent side to Chome Infiltration produce 30% more Solaris. Big deal. Or uh, the recruitment, recruitment Center, plus two training slots, plus 0.5 manpower. Military units are trained 20% faster, 20% health for military units, 50% experience gains for all military units, 50% units regen. I love it. Now they're expensive, yes, but as your empire grow, your economy does as well. You can also get uh, additional benefits if you fill up districts. So for example, I've got three economy buildings in the same district, and so I get the economic lobby, 20% hegemony from Chome Shares, which is a special operations thing, which I don't think I've unlocked yet, have I? I might have. Actually, I'm going to start doing that then once I am uh, can pop out some operations here. In fact, before that punishment thing comes in, let me, uh, let me put Ghost Market over here to try to just steal a little bit of resources and spice from a house of tradies, because frankly, they deserve it. They've been messing with me, so it's time I mess with them. I'm going to need more counter espionage, but I've got all the agents I've currently got active, um, I can probably reassign you, frankly. I don't need that much Arrakis infiltration right now, but I do need more agents eventually. Right. What were we, uh, what, what do we want here? What do we want, what do we want? Uh, statecraft, influence production, landslide infiltration, hmm. Intelligency, totally tell 2% agents, gains 2% additional operation slots. That'd be neat, but not like decisive. Or just an even bigger army. I mean, I got plenty of resources, so uh, even bigger army, me thinks would be uh, me thinks would be fun. So even bigger army, bigger, go bigger. 
The various factions also have, on top of everything else, unique mechanics. Like, for example, you can see that House Harkonnen has the Central Command as a unique uh, research, and Martial Economy and Instill Fear and Cruel Reputation as unique researchers. They can also go to villages, let's see if we got to go on here, like uh, Kulat here, and I can use Oppression, which increases 200% village resource production, building construction 200% faster, and 20% percent militia power so what would we want over here what we want what we want we would want um intel i'm kind of feeling like a, i've got mm, nah i got a good amount of intel i don't need that knowledge i could need some more knowledge i actually could use a little bit more knowledge i could use some more fuel cells too but i'm not in desperate need of fuel cells right now yeah, let's do knowledge, and once we're at it, actually, let's burn through some plast steel, uh, plast crate, excuse me, <laughs> uh, on getting some craft workshops up so I can start producing some hegemony to keep myself well ahead of the competition. There's also quite a lot of ways to win the game, which is neat too. You can, of course, just wipe out all of your enemies, which is always a nice way of winning the game, and you also gain hegemony by uh, defeating enemy units. Or, you can win the game by becoming the official governor of Dune via the Landsraad. Or, you can become... you can just uh, gain enough hegemony to basically overwhelm the enemy. Man. This is a really cool game. This is a really cool game. Oh, and yes, yet another mechanic is, of course, that you can use your agents to carry out special operations in these areas, like here, the water cellar caravan. I can send one Arrakis infiltration agent to get me some money, or I can spend 500 gold to have the Nomad spread some propaganda and give me some authority. Well, I could always need some more authority, so let's do that. Now... Let's uh, let's take away some of uh, House Atreides' mining operations, because I don't feel like they deserve having mining operations, frankly. And we'll fortify this thing a little bit more as well, because... Uh, who knows? They might take issue with me doing this to them. And a heavy militia. Sandworm? Ah, oh, there you go. Over there, it's fine. You've also got the uh, the Spice Guild, so... There will be an imperial tax levied against you every, um... Oh, damn. Uh, that's quite a while. Uh, a period of days. I think it's like once per month or something. There will be a spice tax. Uh, the Atreides don't like me infiltrating their house, do they? Oh, Jesus. There's a... There's a launcher up there, too? Ooh, well, that's uncomfortable. There's two. Ow, okay. Huh. AI is having itself a good old-fashioned little turtling around here, have it? Hmm, okay. Well, I think I've got enough dudes to deal with this, though I do want to be careful to not use my la lose my lands rod, as uh, now that I am no longer judge of the council, I can't rebuild those, and they're very, 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 very good. Right, we'll beat that down, and I think we're going to do the same up here, just to make sure that those... Guns are silenced, and we're going to take control over this one. You can also pillage them, and you can also liberate them. And liberation is probably what I'm going to do to this stronghold up here. Yeah, I am uh, I am being a little bit risky here, but luckily, it looks like House Atreides did not put in a sufficient garrison up here. Oh, how very, very unfortunate. Well... I guess this place will be liberated then. Yeah, that that is not going to be enough of an army to defend your territory here, I'm afraid. Nowhere even remotely close to enough, actually. Let's put down a supply drop here to make sure that I've got some regen and keep, keep my dudes going. Combat drones might look like flying units, by the way. They're not. They're not actually flying units. They're just ground units like everything else, except their models hover. That's about it. As you can see, there are also a little bit of uh, performance issues here and there. Ah, goddammit. These... Oh, this isn't even Atreides. These are the bloody smugglers that's trying to screw with me now. Hey, What are you getting involved with this for? This is not your fight, though I will kill you all the same, you know. 
I do feel like the AI is... The AI almost certainly does not have uh, Fog of War. Ah, oh, goddammit, I'm gonna lose a landslide unit due to it. Yep, yep, their, their pathfinding is bugging. Lovely. Ah, oh, that is that is actually annoying, because I did not want to use a landslide unit for that. You've also constantly got to watch over your units, because they will just stop fighting uh, if you're not giving them attack orders. They'll continue fighting in melee relatively well, but ranged units do need that extra bit of babysitting, and let's make sure we get into combat with those bloody snipers, shall we? Because they do do an awful lot of damage. Right, the loss of the Lancelot unit is... Oh god, a worm. Right now? Could you not? I don't want a worm right now. Right. Well, make sure we've got everyone on solid bedrock. But yes, the um, AI seem to interfere whenever you're fighting anyone else. And amusingly as well, you see how the worm sign disappeared when it was just the AI's units in the area? Well, never mind. <laughs> see... I had a suspicion that the AI might not have to deal with worms, because every time I've seen it, the AI have, has just completely ignored it. But no, it's not that the AI doesn't get problems with worms, it's that the AI is too stupid to flee from the worms. <laughs> not- oh god, I- damn it, I, I completely spaced out on actually caring about the elections, because otherwise I would have tried to become the judge of the council now, wouldn't I, but- Oh well, there you go. I was busy commentating, okay? I have an excuse, but yes. It's just that the AI doesn't understand what a worm is. Seems a foolish thing, yet nevertheless, that is reality. Anywho, I'm going to wrap it up there. For an, uh, in particular, for an early access game, this is a damned good product, and... I would imagine, I would hope indeed, that it would only get better from here, with even more factions, even more mechanics, and so long as they don't do something uniquely stupid, and they'd have to, they, they'd have to step far out of their wheelhouse to screw this one up, uh, judging by the quality of the game so far, I highly recommend this game. Like, this is probably one of the best strategy games I have played in recent memory straight up very 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 solid until next time i have been arch thank you all very much for watching and i hope to see you all again soon till then have a good day <laughs>